Welcome back to the pod. You have me, Jeff Wu. We have Joey Levy. Today, we actually have our first honored guest, Brent Saunders. Uh, you might have heard of a company called Bosch & Lom. I know I'm a, almost a daily user of your, one of your products. I wear contact lenses, but it's one of the biggest pharma eye health companies in the world beyond business. I think we just got became friends socially in the Miami ecosystem. So, Brent, welcome to the program. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored and excited. I just remember moving here three, three and a half years ago. Jake introduced me to Mark Roberts, one of your dear friends, and you were one of like the closest friends with, with Mark. And I remember you almost being like a kind, I don't think you consider yourself a host, but I felt like you and Mark were kind of hosts of Miami as I was entering this like big tech, business, capital bubble. I'm curious from your perspective, what the last three, three and a half years have felt like as you just built a... Yeah, sure. So I, I moved here in 18, so to me that wasn't that long ago, but it was like a pioneer in Miami uh, timeline, right? And uh, I came from New York City, so I was really looking at Miami and saying, how do we create more energy, more entrepreneurs, more business community, really make it more dynamic, not just about tourism or real estate or, or hospitality. And so when people like like you would show up, I, I, I would roll out the red carpet, right, and say, all right, how do we get this young, really talented, uh, you know, great resume guy to, to think of Miami as a possible place to live? And I was excited as you started to, to lay more roots down here. And now it's happening, you know, at a rate that was unimaginable to me before, but it's so exciting to watch what's happening in Miami. I was chairman and CEO of a company called Allergan at the time I moved here. Okay. Which was a much bigger company. Right. Many people know it because it makes Botox. Right. Um, but uh, no, I was uh, I, I was the CEO of that company for s several years. Right. Yeah. No, so I think that to me was a segue to, in terms of like the resume of being involved in 60, 70 billion plus dollar M&As and, 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 and transactions, right? Like in terms of big pharma, which is like a scary buzzword in, in <laughs> on all these days. So in, in some sense, you can, I think, very clearly speak to that because you've been in very senior chairman, CEO, CEO roles of these quote unquote big pharma companies. I'm curious from just like knowing you personally as like a good high integrity human being, why do you think that the public or politicians and their political campaigns are talking about big pharma in a negative way? I mean, I, I think with, you know, vaccines, COVID, all, all this stuff, I think it's been very politicized, but I'm, you know, one of the topics I want to unpack with you is what's your perception of that? Yeah, no. So it's true. I think, um, when you look at data and, and, and you ask the public, the American public, um, what are the most distrusted institutions in our country? Big Pharma tends to tie Congress for the lowest <laughs> uh, approval Amazing. rating. And by the way, what beats us is big tobacco and oil and everything else. <laughs> and and if you kind of unpack that and you step, step back and look at it and you say, how the hell did that happen, right? Pharmaceutical companies make medicines that extend or save lives. Is make that people a more feel recent better. Phenomena, or is no, it, it's been going on for several years, yeah. maybe even a decade. Yeah, and and you say, okay, you know, tobacco companies make cigarettes and kill people, right? That lead to death and illness, and pharmaceutical company makes things that make you feel better or live longer or, or be healthier or solve disease, right? And how did we get there, right? Yeah. And I think if you really, and I've looked at this very carefully, but if you really want to overly simplify it, it's because when you were sick. What's the first thing you think about? What pill do I take to feel better? Yeah. Like, what makes this go away, right? I have a cold. What makes this go away? I have a, a, an infection. Where's my antibiotic, right? Like, where, what do you need? And then you go to the pharmacy, and if it's not free, you're angry, right? Yep. And if it's $5, maybe you're okay. If it's $20, you start to get agitated. And if it's $300 or $700, you're really upset, right? And the problem is most people have insurance, through their work or, or through a government program. And the insurance companies haven't done a good job at covering medicines. They've always been a carve out. And, and so that has created this, this really tough positioning for, for the industry. Yeah, and I think just spending a little bit of time on this, just as, a, as curious and as a hobbyist, if you will, okay. it feels like so much of it just also with the insurance companies, the payers. I mean, I don't know if we want to unpack that whole like incentive yeah, structure there. Yeah, there, there's what what people refer to as the middlemen, right? Yep. So there's the people who you know discover and, and manufacture the medicine, and then the, and then by the time it, you take it as a patient, 
a lot of people have touched it along the way. As an inventor of a medicine, you don't set the price for the consumer, right? The price gets set by other people along that chain, and we call them the middlemen. So they're the insurance companies, the PBM, the pharmacy, uh, the distributor, everybody that's that's in that 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 run. And and so you know it it's what is what is that exact value chain for maybe people who don't like understand the the different nuances of that. And also for my own curiosity, I haven't spent a ton of time thinking about how sort of medicines go from sort of ideation to development to the end consumer, like what, what exactly is in the middle? So the way it gets to from uh, someone who's discovered it, just say a big pharmaceutical company to the patient is generally through, you know, physically through a distributor. Um, they're big ones like Cardinal or McKesson or Ameris or Spurgeon to a pharmacy to a patient, Got it. right? The pricing is a little different, right? The pricing then gets managed by a variety of different middlemen and, and contracts. And so the most common way in a commercial insurance and even in Medicare, which are the largest consumers of, of health care, yep. right, um, they, they usually get priced by, by what's called a PBM, a pharmacy benefit manager, right? So your employer or the governor, government has hired these organizations to manage that spend for them, right, where they own it, like United Healthcare owns their own PBM. And they generally work on a rebate system. So... If the retail cost of a drug is $500, that's what the pharmaceutical company wants to charge. They then negotiate rebates with the health plan or the insurance company that says, you pay $500 and you get X number of usage, we'll rebate you X amount. So when I started in this industry, the rebates used to be 10, 15%. The rebates today are 65, 70, 75, 80%. So in other words, if I sold, if a company made a cancer drug and they sold it for $100, they're only getting 30 of that 100. Wow. And they had to spend the billions of dollars to do the R&D at risk, right? And, and, and what's the reason for the spread changing? It's very really interesting because like, I think from a consumer or e-commerce world, right? Like it's almost like an affiliate fee to pay for marketing. Right. Yeah. So and what changes very, is... So is like, the, yeah. like the marketing or distribution side is a dominant cost. That's right. Yeah. Well, there was a tremendous over the last decade, tremendous consolidation of the insurers and the PBMs. So now, you know, there, there's a handful of insurers that, that manage most of the covered lives in the United States, right? And so they have just huge negotiating power. Right. Interesting. Is that reflecting the stock prices? Because I feel like I see these healthcare systems or healthcare providers well, or insurance companies kind of like linear right. regression in stock prices. Yeah, pharma I think companies. Yeah, but if you look at it, so take um, the largest insurance in the United States is United Healthcare, yep. right? Um, not a great year for them. They've had some theater breaches and, and other setbacks, but don't quote me on these yep. numbers. But if you go back from, I don't know, let's say 2012 to 2022, that 10-year period, yep. number one performing stock on the yeah. top. It literally is like a steady compounder. Like it, yep. it just compounds. Yes. Yep. So that's a sign of they basic. they basically had pricing power over the... By controlling companies. the distribution of all these. No, the drugs, uh, rebates yeah. are a significant issue. Um, yeah. It's very complicated for most people to follow and understand. And so it doesn't make a great political issue. It's easier to blame the innovator, yeah. right? And and just say, big pharma companies charging X, Y, Z. And, and look, could we do better? Of course, right? But it's not, it's a quite a complex story to yeah. really unpack. I feel like one of the big internet memes of like the big pharma conspiracy is that big pharma buys a lot of mainstream mm. news news ads, and therefore the mainstream news anchors can't criticize big pharma. Real, not real, cap. How do we d- truth debunk? Your, yeah, your perspective. I, I mean, I, I tweeted on this. It was probably the most controversial tweet yeah. I, I made. I and I had a bunch of people really come <laughs> at me for it, but. You know, I, over my career, I, I, I have spent billions of dollars of, of TV advertising. I have never once tried to influence content or editorial content on TV. Um, you know, do we try to create awareness and and and, and purchasing power of, of patients and consumers to buy our products? Absolutely. That's why we have ads, right? Yeah. But do we try to influence the content of the TV itself? No. Do we, we say we don't want to be on this program or that program because maybe, you know, outside of our of our area of interest absolutely but we don't we don't say don't air that program or don't we don't you know don't hire that news anchor or don't talk about that topic i that, i've never been aware of anybody doing that 
So like new, like yeah. So like n- the news program is not asking you for permission or editorial edits. It's just like hey, no. I'm an nor do we have advocacy to, to try to change it. Right. Yeah. yeah. That just doesn't exist now. Um, I get you know, I th- I think the pharmaceutical industry is in the top five or ten purchasers of media, and that's probably increasing because the target demographic is generally older and they still watch TV. Yep. Younger generations don't watch TV and. Um, and, and so, you know, that will change over time, but, uh, and, and social media is tough for pharmaceutical companies to, because we have to do the fair balance for every second. We talk about the benefit. We have to talk about the risk. Right. And that's, I was, I was going to ask about that. Like, how do you view social media marketing to, to, you know, yeah, it's hard because you, you, you can't do anything spontaneous with the, cause there the, has to be a disclaimer, legal requirement, disclaimer language. Um, and so we, I've, I've tested it. I've tried it. Yeah. Um, and it just, you know, people who consume social media don't want paid media, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you can't just drop a product placement. Yeah. Right. I couldn't just have this sitting on the, yeah. you know, the ketone sitting on the table. I couldn't have a, a, a drug sitting on the table. Yeah. That would be, the FDA would get yeah. uh, upset. Even if there was like a disclaimer coming across. I'd have to do the, the whole disclaimer. For, for the entire right. episode. And yes. yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's like in that media landscape, I can understand from like the conspiracy folks, like the Steelman argument is that as long as there's money being transmitted, like there's going to be some implicit like, oh, they're a supporter in some way. But I feel like when people go into journalism, they're not thinking, oh, who are who's sponsoring my news channel? Right. And therefore, I'm going to skew my perspective. But I think that underlying tone is there. But again, I think it's like, it, it's something that's like saying the car companies, they're, they're very large. They're the Car companies right. influence the content. I don't think so. Maybe they do. I don't. I don't. Right. But I, I, I don't just don't think it works that way. I think that's that's. I agree. Know. I think I think it's fair. And then I think that is like an interesting. I'm, I'm actually curious, is knowing that you're quite plugged into tech. I know that you have a number of venture investments. We can transition into that. But staying on the advertising slot, just I know from Better, you know, one of the big advantages of why Better is growing so quickly is owning and really optimizing for social media. How do you see that? demographic ship ha- ha- happening, right? Like the boomers are aging, you know, millennials now are like in their forties, right? Like millennials are like going to die soon. Um, so <laughs> <Let's hope not. laughs> yeah, yeah. no, the pharmaceutical does their job, right? Well, yeah. we'll keep exactly. them alive longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but uh, yeah, I think it's like, how, how do you, how does the industry or how do you think about how do you get attention? How do you get eyeballs as the platforms shift? It's not easy, right? It, it, it becomes more challenging. Um, you know, social media can be done. It's not as as authentic as other advertising on social media. Um, but traditional media, live sports, um, you know, there are still programming that works. There's there's still billboards. There's still radio. There's still, you know, there's still ways to get the message out. And, and to be fair, as social media becomes more dominant, those things become more accessible or, or less expensive to, to do. But um, there, there will be some way we have to figure it out, right? There, there will be some technology that we'll be able to figure out how to, to make sure that whatever it is we're promoting on social media has what's called fair balanced advertising, which is what the, the law requires. I mean, has there been a thought to lobby to change that law? I mean, maybe it's like an unpopular sort of thing to ask and, you know, consumers, like, like most people may say, oh, this is like an important law to have, but at the same time, you guys are building products that really improve people's lives and social media is becoming the predominant distribution platform now. So having some sort of actual opportunity to distribute through those channels seems important, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, cause those laws yeah. were presumably developed for a world where advertising True. was done predominantly over and live this television. this may be, sound strange coming from me, but I don't necessarily think we have to get rid of the fair balance as a way to, I think we have to figure out how to do it with the fair balance. Yeah. The reason being, and I'll, I'll say this very clearly, there is no such thing as a safe drug, right? Every drug has some sort of reaction. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the basic theory. For every op- action, there's an opposite but equal reaction, right? And so if you're taking a chemical or a biological material to solve a problem, you will create some sort of side effect. And patients should know the risks and talk to their doctor about whether it's worth it, yeah. right? And, and so in my career, and I say this to my, my wife and kids all the time, you know, just don't take that antibiotic. Like, do you really need it, right? That should always be the question because there is a risk associated with, with taking even a Z-Pack, right? I'm curious in terms of just going back to your, your your story as an executive, as an entrepreneur, I think 
a lot of our audience are folks coming in from startups, venture capital. Like the pharma ecosystem is, is I think very intimidating for most people, right? There's like the regulatory drug trial approval process that's very intimidating. There's just the hardcore biology. Yep. You should actually understand the mechanisms of action, how all these uh, right. flows actually work. Um, I know just from, you know, working with Joanne better, right? There's equally very complex regulatory on, on gaming and, 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 and sports. I'm curious as you lay out the expertise areas in your personal stack of what makes you world class, um, what does it take to be a public pharma uh, company CEO? Yeah, I mean, you have to have great people. And so no, probably no different, Joey, than how you think about it. But, you know, for us, we need amazing scientists, right? We, we need, you know, I always say the worst day in, in my companies, in my professional career in my companies, is the day we hurt a patient. Right, a patient takes something and some unintended thing happens that's not positive. And so, you know, most people think about the pharmaceutical industry, despite what people think. I've known, I've, I've been in it for 30 years. Everyone comes because they think they're doing something good for mankind, right? That they're going to solve some sort of big problem. That's why people work there. And so they don't want to do things that hurt people. Now, I know the perception may be very different, but that's the reality. People come to work every day to try to do something better. And so, you know, you really do want to understand how your medicines work, right? And, and you really do need to understand the mechanism of action. You really need to know the side effect profile. And then it's, it's what we call risk-benefit analysis, right? Is the benefit of taking the medicine outweigh the risk? And so the more the severe the disease, right? So if you have end-stage cancer, the more risk you're willing to, to take. Mm -hmm. the, the less severe the disease, the less risk. So I always say, like, I, I had a big business in aesthetic medicine, Botox, Juvederm, all those things, right, were my brands. And, and I always said the standard for an aesthetic medicine is much, much higher because you don't have a sick patient, right? When I'm trying to reduce the wrinkles with Botox, I can't afford to have any negative side effects because you're not sick. So think of the, about the, where the fulcrum sits in the balance. Yeah, it's not like an essential thing right. to do. Yeah. Now, if you had end-stage cancer, you'd be willing well, to accept a lot a more bit. risk, yeah. right? And so those are the two ends of the spectrum, but, but, but that's how I think about it. And so surround yourself with great people. Starts with your scientists. That's table stakes, like great science is table stakes for the industry and really good regulatory people. And then you have to figure out what's your market and how do you best communicate your message to patients and physicians. I'm, I'm curious in terms of like the scale that you operated to, right? Like you were literally part of the, some of the biggest transactions and companies in this industry. I don't, I don't know if this is public or not, but I remember an anecdote you told me that you had an opportunity to merge with Pfizer. and I was public. <laughs> you were like, and you're going to be like the CEO of this Pfizer allergen <laughs> mega merger. Right. And the Obama administration like vetoed it. What is that like to be operating at such a scale where it's like a national presidential level, administration level topic? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, you know, you're trying to do what you think is right that will create value for shareholders a big, you know, we were hoping we would have the biggest R and D organization in the world, right? We had we had really a lot of value that we could create by doing that. But you know, we announced the deal, so it was public. Um, it was several months after the announcement where the government stepped in and, and said, "No, we're not going to allow this to happen." Now they used uh, Treasury regulations to to kill the deal. Um, so it wasn't like antitrust. It was they did not use antitrust. They used Treasury regs. Um, and Specifically, what were they? On that well, point. we were, uh, Allergan was an Irish company. We were headquartered in Dublin. Pfizer was a U.S. company. Got it. And they basically said, you, you, can't, you can't leave the United States, right, um, for tax purposes. And they proposed rules that ultimately didn't, were, were, were overruled by the courts, but that was two years later. So the deal was gone by, by, by that point. But um, I do remember um, the Obama administration I think they called me, don't quote me again on the exact words, they, they called me an unpatriotic CEO. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm the most patriotic citizen you can have. I'm, I'm a big <laughs> believer in the United States. But they did, they did, uh, they did call me an unpatriotic CEO. And I, I'm curious, how's, like, how is that from like, a personal perspective, right? Like, just like the, you as a business executive. But it must be interesting from a personal perspective. that It was actually like pretty you're, difficult, you're, yeah, because you know, I'd put a lot of energy. I'd done a lot of work to make that deal happen. Um, we had communicated to all of our employees around the world. We had started the inter 
pre-integration process. Like there was a lot. We, How many employees in, in total? Would <laughs> yeah, we probably had uh, round numbers. We had probably about 40,000 oh. and Pfizer, I think, had 120,000. Um, we had redone management teams. We had we had um, s- executives that we departed um, as part of the process. Full we were pretty far down the road. Yeah, so. you guys were integrating Full organizations. Yeah, yeah. Well. So I, I remember w- when I heard about it, I was coming back from a sales conference. I was with our sales teams, um, and I heard about it, and I, I used the plane ride to kind of decompress and, and say, all right, you know, this really stinks, right? Like, what the hell am I going to do now? And then I, when I got on the ground, I said, all right, you know, look, I'm the leader here. I got to, you know, dust myself up, get up and, and put my game face on and, and find the path forward. And, 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 you know, I just spent several months telling the team this, we're doing this for this reason, that reason, we're going to be a stronger company together. And I had to go back and say, forget that. (laughs) And we're we're going in this direction And we're going to be just fine. And we're going to be just fine. And it was probably the most challenging then two weeks of, of my professional career and just, because, you know, to be, to my opinion, to be a good leader, maybe you would agree, Joey, um, for better, it's all about leadership to your team, right? Yes. Leadership by example, leadership through humility, leadership by, by, by insp- inspiration, right? And, and when you have a huge setback like that, to really get that internal fortitude to, to, to get back up and go, all right, guys, you know, rah, 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 let's go, right? Yeah. A hundred percent agree. And it's, and it's especially important, not when things are going really well, but when there's setbacks and, you know, just keeping things on track and keeping people motivated and, and reminding people why we're here in the first place. And, um, things aren't always going to go according to plan. They never do. Yeah. (laughs) They never do. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you're right. That's, but that's what leadership is about. If it were easy, everybody would be doing it. I'm curious in terms of just like the I would say over the last few years, there's been just a number of formats to help people capitalize and, and construct businesses. I know that you formed the SPAC and you SPAC the company. You're a public company CEO. I imagine that I know you're an active venture investor. Uh, you're the chairman of Rome. Uh, Howard's company is a mutual friend. I'm curious like, to get your lay of the land, right? Like I'm just an early stage venture capital tech founder. I think, Joey, we're all kind of early stage guys. Curious to, you know, hopefully get to, to, to your shoes. We're playing in terms of all the capital stack. Just kind of, it'd be great to have you lay out the land in terms of what you've liked, enjoyed about the experience of each construct. Yeah, I mean, so it's funny. You guys look at what I do and you say, oh, that's really cool or interesting. We hope I look at what you guys do and say, <laughs> that's really cool and I can learn a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's grass is always greener yeah. probably. But look, I, I love being around entrepreneurs. Um, and, and I love, you know, for example, I've learned so much, even though I'm chairman of, of, of Howard Lerman's company, Rome. I've learned so much just from watching him, watching him, you know, build tech, build his team, hire the engineers, lead them through, build his customer service. Like watching a founder just go, you know, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, you don't have that in corporate America on a regular basis, right? People are much more on a, on a structured, whatever it may, I'm not sure it's nine to five, but nine to six or eight to five or eight to seven or whatever it may be. But, you know, people don't live and breathe their company on a daily basis like you do in a startup. And, and I find that energy in a startup so infectious. Uh, and it, it's, it's addicting. Like, I'm, I want to be around founders and entrepreneurs and startup companies because they, they just, it, it's, it's really infectious energy, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I love that. But some of the ingredients are still the same, right? It's a great team, right? People are probably the most important formula to any business and then a great idea, and then good execution, right? And if you get all three of those to be great, it usually works. No, I, th- I think that's, I think it's pretty consensus. Like, I mean, I don't think it needs to be, I think it's well said, and it's, it's not broken. Like, in terms of SPACs, right? Like, I'm curious, how, that, well, what was that process like for you? Like, did you enjoy that experience? I mean, I feel like now after the pandemic bubble boom cycle, I think it's kind of got out of favor with how to finance companies but it sounded like, I felt like you, you had the timing nice on, on, on. Yeah, look, I think there's a role for SPACs. I think like anything, the pendulum swung too far and yeah. it was the flavor of the day and everybody, you know, and their and their mother wanted to do a SPAC, yeah. right? Every idea was SPACable, right? Yeah. And, you know, everybody, the, the lawyers, the bankers, the investors, everybody, you know, had their own angle for why it was good for them. I'm glad that bubble burst because I think it was way overdone. Um, but that doesn't mean all SPACs are bad either, right? It's... It, 
everyone is a un- it's like saying it's a, it's a few startups tool. like it's right. like saying FTX went bankrupt so all crypto is bad it's, right. it just makes no sense right you know I, I I really think there's a role for SPACs like there's a role for IPOs there's a role for private companies there's a role for public companies right there, there is a spot for a SPAC right. um, and I think in my humble opinion uh, the best SPACs are when the when the, the the SPAC comes with smart money people who really have been there done that really deep experience, really understand the, the vertical, they understand the market, they understand the tech, whatever it is that's that's being de spac but they, they bring more than just capital. Yeah, it was weird at the time because every celebrity had a SPAC, and it was just like, what are they going to do beyond right. being, quote, unquote, dumb money? Right. Money is great, too, but, like, people would, would redeem their money, like, so all that money wasn't even there. Yeah. Right. So it was kind of a, a lot well, of And, and, and every, you know, well-accomplished business person tried to do a SPAC, but then, you know, what I always found odd, and I, I, I should have created a short SPAC fund. I wasn't that smart. <laughs> but, but, you know, the formula that I saw that, that worked almost every time is if that person, you know, or a celebrity or whoever it was, did a SPAC, but they bought something out of their domain expertise. Right. Right. So, like, they were a great finance person, but they bought a healthcare company. And look at it and be like, okay, they don't know what they're... They had no business being there. They had they diligence it. How are they going to add value to it? Right. Like right. What, what saw they a bunch know? of that, right. like former athletes getting involved in like very deep technology right. companies when there's probably spackable sort of sports related opportunities that they could have added more value. to. Absolutely. Right? So that's yeah. I always looked at why are they driving that SPAC and and are they going to drive it in their swim lane or are they going to go and jump three lanes over if they're jumping short it. Right. That would have been my my short theory. People have tried to SPAC better. Yeah, and just like oh, I'm sure, right? Yeah, we've gotten a couple of uh, proposals for that, but um, right, yeah, but it, it's you interesting. Had a great, yeah. if, I don't know. It, back in the day when he was who he was, like if a Steve Wynn came to you and said, sure. yeah. then you'd be like, all right, I got to listen to Steve Wynn, right? Yeah, hundred percent. And, and there have been some good teams too. I think the the predominant reason why we haven't gone that route yet is we're just so early as a business. I mean, Jake and I founded this company two years and three months ago, and we have sufficient access to private capital yeah. and just like, and I'm sure you could appreciate this better than, than most people in the world. Like, and, and I don't appreciate it, but I had to do a little bit of diligence into this as we were thinking about it, but the amount of incremental work that comes with being a publicly traded company and preparing for that from a financial reporting and procedures and compliance perspective is just would have put such a, a level of strain on a company that really is just, initially trying to go from zero to one and one to N and build something that people care about. So that, that was really like a big, well, I'll give you a unsolicited advice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, being a public company is very difficult. Um, it comes with some benefits, but it comes with a lot of other challenges. What would you say are like the prime, sorry to cut you off, yeah. but like what, what would you say are some of the primary benefits and, and draw well, access to capital, right? Yeah. You, you'll get a very different access to capital. You'll be able to, you know, depending on what you need, you'll be able to, to, to raise debt and or sell equity as two main mechanisms to access capital much more efficiently than perhaps a private company. Sure. Yeah. That being said, if you don't need those two things, yeah. why would you ever in a million years do it, right? If you had access to private capital that was at an appropriate cost, there's no reason to even think about it because the burden of being a public company first is expensive, um, and then you've got a community of people that that are going to second guess every decision very publicly, in the form of sell side analysts and others, and you have to manage the consensus game. You're going to have to manage all the disclosure and all the other things that you have to do that really takes. Uh, a lot of energy and a lot of focus off of operating the business, which is so critical. Right? And thinking long term, right? Like a lot of the decisions we make, I mean, we're planning right now, not just for this upcoming NFL season and sort of, you know, a uh, couple of quarters from now, but thinking about 2025, 2026. And a lot of the decisions that we may make today, if, if it was done in a more public setting, may not intuitively make sense. Well, to I us think people. actually you raised, I, I should have said it because perfect point, Joey. When I started in public companies, there were many investors. We called them long only, right? And that comes from they were long-term oriented, right? Long onlys, there's still a few out there that are amazing, excellent investors, but most of them are, are not. They're, they're short-term. The PM on the account is is, is being about it at, at quarterly p and or, or best case annual. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there is so much short-termism. And so much pressure on short termism that it's hard to get investors in a public company to think long term. 
where private investors do come in more long-term oriented. No, I mean, it's it's very much their job to, to think that way. Right? Even to private think equity. Five to 10 year cycles. Yeah, private yeah. equity used to be the short term investors because people would say their hold period is three, four, five, seven years, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. private equity is long term investors. Yeah, relative to what's markets. going on in the public markets. Yeah, yeah. But I'm curious to pull on that string a little bit because I think Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are like the best leaders in which to tell that story in the public markets where their access to capital is essentially infinite. In this like very, I would say like social media organic landscape, is that more incumbent for CEOs, public company people to just be more real, more out there, telling the story? Well, I think it's different. I, I think it, when you look at Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or, or Zuckerberg or, you know, you have founder led companies where they are generally either majority still shareholders or they have they have Supporting, voting rights yep. and, and different classes of stock. And so they aren't as pressured by conventional short termism that most normal companies. Mm. So perhaps maybe the lesson, Jeff, is if you're a founder of a company and you can pull it off, but you'd have to have a fantastic idea and hit the market right, try to do something that allows you to, to, to continue to stay focused on a more long term path. Right. Right. You're, you're able under sort of those more nuanced voting structures to have more of a stomach for short term right. sort of price fluctuations yeah. because, yeah, that makes sense. So what I do, I, and I say this to my team all the time, meeting our quarterly obligations is our ticket to entry to be able to think long term. Yeah. Because I am a long term thinker and I really do try to think three, five years out all the time. The reason I get that permission to do that from my investors is because I make my quarterly numbers. Hitting right, I yeah. certainly try to make them every quarter. Yeah, yeah. and sense. I've made them the overwhelming majority of my career. I think I've only missed one or once or twice out of probably eighty quarters or so. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Now I'm, I feel like there's just that's such an art and intuition or and the science that'll plan that right because because like I'm just like thinking in terms of like private startups right like the forecasts matter less because you're not it's not like a liquid thing that people will measure you on. But I think even just when we talk internally, like, do you sandbag? Do you be aggressive? It's just like they this still, They art. always matter. Like yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine who who's a PM at one of these hedge funds that sort of is right. like very, uh, you know, volatile and sort of how they approach the market. And he was talking about one particular company in our space. And, and just when they put a forecast out, they're so consistently hitting forecasts that they just, okay, that's what they're going to do next quarter. And, and they just gain so much credibility right. by, by But you hit the, the magic word. It's credibility, yeah, right? Exactly. Private, public, establishing credibility as, a, as an operator, as a, a leader is critical in everything you do. And so it's, you know, if if you give outlandish forecasts, you will have a hard time creating credibility, yeah. right? And no one, who wants to invest in anything, private, public, your friends thing, if, if they're not credible? It's all about trust, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it is. Do right. I trust what this person says or not? Right. A hundred percent. And the way right. you gain trust is by doing what you say you will do. Which I think it's like, it reminds me of just like, it comes full circle, right? Like business isn't supposed to be that hard. It's like a group of people organized together on some goal to make some. You sound like an investor. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard, man. Yeah, fair. I'm curious. I'm to no, I know, I, I know what he's saying. Like, and so, like it just is, it, it really paper, is like right? do, doing what you say you will do. Like if it just distill it to that. Look, if the world, if everybody gonna, in the world just did what they said they were going to do, yeah. life would be easy. Yeah. I give you that. Yes. But no, this shit is hard, man. Yeah. And there are yeah. always variables, right? You can't, yeah. you can't. So many things that you just don't control. Right. right. Wanted to ask you about just talking about investing and whatnot, like public company CEO dealing with a whole set of, you know, challenges that are pretty unrelated to the daily challenge challenges that maybe I would deal with or Jeff deals with. But I presume a lot of founders come to you for angel investment or emerging fund managers looking for LP capital. Like, I guess specifically on entrepreneurs who are maybe pre-seed, seed, series A stage, what are some of the ways you determine okay that entrepreneur is a winner that team is a winner that idea is a winner versus you know perhaps some of the yellow or red flags that would discourage you from making an investment for me that the, the number one thing i look at is the person right are they credible have they done it before do they know what they're talking about do they have the passion and and commitment to work hard right are they going to be up at if, they, if they're writing code at two o'clock on a saturday to get the the code done right do they have that in their DNA? Can you can you figure out they have that drive and passion and, and capability to, to achieve what they say they're going to do? And then I start to look for, at other traits, like do they have a followership? Like could they lead people? Do people want to work for them or with them? 
right? Um, and so I look to a lot of the soft things. A lot of people get focused on, I and mean, a lot of my friends do this, what a great idea, we should invest in that idea. I'm like, yeah, but who's doing it? Like, that's more important to me than the idea. I've run my career that way. I look at people as the most important asset of any any business idea or company. And so it's it's the person, yeah. right? That's all that matters to me. The idea is secondary. And so sometimes you meet somebody and be like, you know, if they wanted to sell shoelaces, I'd invest with them because you just know that that person's going to drive it, right, and, and succeed. And is it mostly intuition based? Is are there a particular set of questions that you like to ask, or you just kind of? Yeah, I mean, intuition? it depends on each one, right? But I do try to really get to know the person, yeah. right? And then I try to figure out who else do they know, and can I t- call them, and, and you yeah. know, have they done it before? What did they do before? How did they leave that job if they were in a job and they left to go do this? Like, did they leave? class? Did they go out with a fight? You know, you really just try to understand, um, you know, the DNA and, and mindset and, and capability of that, of that entrepreneur. Yep. Which sectors are you looking at? I, I, biotech, software, AI, consumer? Yeah. I mean, I, I love consumer. I, I have a lot of experience. I started in consumer healthcare. So, so, you know, and I've built a lot of brands and, and, and grew a lot of brands over the years. I love AI. We were talking about yeah. that. I love SpaceX. That's a, that's a big investment for me. To me, the most consequential companies that I got to see over the last few years that I did invest in were OpenAI and SpaceX. You know, to me, I, I viewed both of those of the next 10 years, and this was a few years ago, so maybe the next eight or nine years. Like, what company is going to have such a profound impact on, on humanity, right, than those two companies? So I got super excited about both of those. Yeah. I mean, I guess on AI, are you, and we spoke about this a little bit last time, like some of the existential concerns of like just AGI and just kind of a lack of control over it. And if it gets into the wrong hands and I mean, d- does that cross your mind at all, particularly as an it early does. And, and look, I think the one, you know, like anything else, when you look at a big problem and, you know, you can say it in, in global warming or whatever, when we look at a big problems so and the real problems, right, that sit out there. The one thing that's always missed in the calculation of how bad it's going to be is human inju- ingenuity interventing to, to solve it, intervening to solve it, right? And and we generally, as as a as a population of people or, or a race, right, humanity, we tend to solve big problems. <laughs> like, and so I think we will figure out, even if we don't know what it is today, because we're concerned about it, we will solve it. I think in the short term, the bigger problem is fraud. How do we authenticate who's saying what? It's like, you know, misinformation or fake information. Yeah, these, right? these deep it's, fakes out there that kind of, yeah. like you have a political leader saying something. It could sound it's, like it's him, it could look like him. Yeah. It can, right. Like our yeah. podcast here, there'll be enough sampling where people can just clone our faces and voices right. and make us say whatever we want. But even, you know, y- your your bank account or whatever it may be, there, there are going to be, you know, AI is going, we're going to need a some new level of technology to authenticate Yeah. You know, Jeff Wu is the person talking right now, and that's really his image, right? Yeah. We're going to need something, some kind of token. Maybe it's going to be it's going to be blockchain driven or something. We're going to need some kind of authentication technology that's unbreakable, like blockchain, right? You know, yep. That 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 authenticates everything. I think it's like funny because like, I feel like crypto and AI are like the most buzzwords of everything, but actually there's a marriage there. There's a marriage there, and I think it's also just from like a GPU cluster. Like wasn't Sam infant. doing that? Wasn't Sam creating a token that would be an authentic? Coin. Yeah, the world. But wasn't that supposed to be have some technology that had authentication? It authenticates by your iris, right? So, like, I like the human iris is basically a unique. I'm an eye care company, so I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Really, yeah. I don't need to explain <laughs> it to you, but maybe no, no, the I'm audience. Joking, I'm no, but apparently, it. I've heard that people are trying to hack Worldcoin by having pig eyes scanning to get the coins. I don't know if. That's believable I mean, the, from your experience. Well, the pig eye wouldn't replicate a human eye, but it would be its own unique eye for sure. Right, yeah. right. At least scan yeah. to like get you know some uh, identifier. I don't know, but someone someone listening hopefully will come up with a great idea to the, be this universal authenticator that's unbreakable. It sounds like in, in the way you almost treat angel investing is, I, is like you, you get like an inside lens in terms of how, how the future is being unfolded. Like that's where I've been spending a lot of time hanging out with Stanford and MIT professors and just like seeing what they're building. And I think just the amount of power in data centers and being built right now is insane. I'm sure if, you know, you're just probably hearing with whether it's open air or meta, they're just, people are trying to find like nuclear power plants. Yeah, to, power's a big issue. To power like 100,000 H100s or A100 GPU chips to just like build AGI. I agree. I Look, if someone, if, if you were, a, 
if you were the state of Florida or the state of New York or California, or whatever, you would think you would say, all right, we want, we want AI here. We want the jobs here. We want the, the, the data centers here. So we're going to start clearing the regulatory hurdles to open these mini nuclear reactors, right? They take, I think they take on, on upwards of five years to, to, so you'd have to start now, right? Um, and, and, you know, off to the races, but, and they're, you know, they're environmentally friendly. They have obviously need safety around them, but um, somebody's going to have to solve that because right. it's not more, alternative energy may come along in time, kind of but it's never going to come with that kind yeah. of power. Not in, not in the next 10 years. Yeah. And that's I think that's sure. where I think it's fun to be at the frontier of investing because I, I don't think we'd be thinking about, oh, like nukes are going to have to be a part of like the future world. Right. Just the amount of power load to have all this inference and compute right. that we expect to be using. Sure. And look, Sam Altman and I think Elon are, are both looking at alternative energy investing, right? Yeah. They've got a few things working, whether it be hydrogen or other other things. But, you know, in the short term, we... We do have nuclear, and we have these we have these small nuclear reactor technology that GE and other people build. Yeah. Do you have any prognostication or crazy, wacky predictions of how the future unfolds? Like to me, the way I extrapolate it out is that every country, every strong polity is going to have their own nuclear powered H one hundred cluster that's going to be like making all their inference decisions and, and computing like different pathways of futures, right? So there's just going to be like a lot of nuclear power plant GPU clusters, and then I think if we go to war, they try to like nuke each other's like H one hundred clusters first. Like I think like yeah, maybe, it gets man, very but, like matrix of you know many very governments quickly. have have completely outlawed nuclear. So like Germany done right, France is out of nu like Europe's getting out of nuclear. Yeah, right. And and the U S. You know we're at it, we've shut it down to like a, a, a drip right. So um, you know someone from a policy perspective has to wake up and say. You want to be a competitive country, and you want you, you want to harness all this compute power. Yep. Like energy is a big deal, and it can't just be fossil fuel. Alternatives a great idea, but we're not going to get there in time. And so let's be pragmatic and like let's 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 create policy to to harness this this tool. And look, Jamie Dimon from J.P. Morgan said, you know, AI is the 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 steam engine of today, right? it is going to change productivity. I even see it in my old line business, like Bausch & Lomb, we're a 170 year old company. We are deploying AI tech into old, you know, what you call old school manufacturing and, and the productivity potential and, and it is massive. And so, you know, if we want to be the best at what we do as in an industry or in a country or, or in a, a technology, we've got to solve this energy thing because, because AI is, is yeah. high energy, consumer yeah, and i think people just are barely understanding that i think for the most average consumer they're like oh it's just chat gpt yeah, it's on my phone I'll yeah just it's just <laughs> like no no no. like there's like literally like gigawatts of power and like people are making massive maybe maybe you guys this. should go take the show on the road and, and go to what a data it? center like <laughs> with the amount of compute for an ai yeah. you know uh, uh <laughs> we'll do it we'll i don't think people would un would blow their minds to see how 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 large that is and how much compute power has to come i guess outside of work like what are like what's your daily routine like you, you like sports like you, you gamble on sports at all what's your uh you know um um i do like sports you know my i have a pretty i'm an early riser always have been um what, what time do you wake up so i i used to get up at five every morning okay. when the pandemic came uh for a different reason i decided to try to increase my sleep because I'm a big longevity person. I, I study the science of longevity. I'm, I'm really, I invest in longevity companies. And the triangle of longevity is sleep, eat, exercise. Yeah. And it's so funny to me how many people do so many other interventions without having those three things done well. Which is probably like 90 to 95%. It's 90, of the whole thing. 90 plus percent yeah. of it is sleep, yeah. eat, exercise. Yeah. All the other stuff you do, you're influencing like, on the small margin. yeah, marginal yeah. percentage of, of outcome yeah um and so i i I've now moved my sleep to closer to 6 a.m like 5 45 6 yeah um so i'm getting like an extra 45 minutes or, or so than i normally do you try to do eight eight hours a night or i i'm no i i wish so i was a chronic five hour guy now i'm a six hour yeah. guy 
Okay. I'm trying to get to seven. It's yeah, not yeah. you can't just snap your fingers and get to seven. Yeah. Anyway, if you've been doing five hours for thirty years, right? You gotta you gotta slowly. So I'm, are you I'm, one of those like genetic yeah. super sleepers, or like you have alarm clock? You're just naturally up. I'm just wake. I've been doing it. It's just habit. Uh, cool. But I love them. I'm a morning person, yep. so I love right. the mornings. It's my favorite part of the day. I like the quiet time. I like to read the news, read Mine's the trade clear. journals. No one's bothering you. Yeah. Figure out what I need to get done for the day. I go to the gym every day. I may not look like it, but I go to the gym every day. Um, and, and so, you know, I try to get that all out of the way before the business day really starts. Um, and that's worked really well for me, but, um, sports I love. Um, I don't bet on sports. I, I just found out from your team that you can do it in Florida, but you got to download the one app. It's oh, uh, hard, hard rock. rock. Bet. Yeah. yeah. So the Seminole I always thought it was illegal Florida. in Florida. Well, so <laughs> so more recently, and it you know it's had some impact on my business. But the the Seminole Tribe of Florida has been working for years to secure a monopoly on online sports wagering. They also have retail, but most yeah. of the money is online. And they they actually launched it, I think, in October of 2021, and then they got sued, and federal court said it was unconstitutional the way that the compact was amended so they had to pause a month later and then they won another legal case i think this past october or november they relaunched it and it's still kind of in in court but it's live right now so you could go on hard rock bet and, and that's how you you know bet yeah, it i just i just found that out but yeah, uh, yeah yeah i mean but i love watching i'm a football you know american football is probably my top sport but i like basketball i love golf so masters is on i mean curious about that longevity piece um you must have seen Brian Johnson, who's like gotten became a meme for being all the longevity stuff. But of course, to me, like I've been in the bio, I've been interested in buying hacking for a long time, ketones and, and all of this stuff. And I'm curious your take on: is he just marketing guy? Is he is he pushing the limits of science? Curious for you to just break down what do you think is real, not real? What's interesting? Yeah, to you? look, I think there's a lot of garbage out there. Um, there's some really interesting ideas, but no data. I'm a science guy. I'm a data guy. Yeah. And, you know, the gold standard is placebo-controlled studies. Hard to do in longevity, right? Because what are you going to do? Follow somebody for 50 years and see if they live if they two die. extra years yeah. at the end, yeah. Yeah. right? So practicality. So you have to look for other biomarkers or other hallmarks of indication, uh, you know, of, of aging. Um, and, and then try to make some some uh, uh, leaps of faith from there. But look, there's a lot of noise out there. Um, there's some really cool science coming. There's some amazing companies doing really interesting uh, work in this area. Some of the stuff is a year or two away, and a lot of it is five, seven years away. I do believe over the next several years, we, we will start to see real pharmaceuticals to extend, you know, health span, right? A healthy. Yeah, like what span. modalities? Are, are these like gene therapies? Are these? A lot of them are small molecules okay. now. Some of them are biologics. A lot of them, are, you know, that are looking at senescence and, okay. and how to, you know, how do you get your body to clear the old dead cells? Right, which are the cause of a lot of inflammation-related diseases. Um, you know, in the old days, we, we used to die by because of infection, right? We didn't have antibiotics, right? And, and so you got a cut, you got an infection, you died, right? And we created antibiotics, and people lived through that. And now we have a lot of diseases like cancer, right, where, where cells mutate and then turn on your body, right, and start to kill your body. We have we used poison chemotherapy to try to kill the bad cells with before they killed the person. Right? It was always the game of can we knock out? We'll give you chemotherapy. We'll give you radiation. We'll give you, you know, essentially poison. Right? And the idea was kill all the bad cells while keeping it as you know. And obviously, when you kill bad cells, you're killing healthy cells. But that's hopefully you kill more bad cells than healthy cells, and you live. Right? And we get rid of the cancer. Now we've got immunotherapy. We we we've actually been able to trick your body to fight the cancer cells, right? And and I think we're closer to the cure for cancer than we've ever been, right? We are solving so many, like cancer is becoming a chronic disease. Unfortunately, it has to be detected early for that to be true. So, you know, we need more screening. We need more preventative care to, to realize the, the solution of cancer, but we're getting really close. In fact, the Merck CEO said on TV the other day, he believes we're really close. Uh, and they We're really close to a cure for cancer. cancer. Yeah, I mean, Keytruda, their immunotherapy drug, has mm -hmm. saved millions of lives. It's it's Amazing. expensive, but it's yeah. saving a lot of lives. Um, well, what's expensive? Just I, I don't know that the actual price, but if it was, it would be unaffordable if it wasn't covered by your insurance. Uh, yeah, Hopefully, your it. insurance and Medicare does cover it. 
hopefully your insurance covers it. Um, but if it isn't, it, it's, you know, you'd have to apply to their patient assistance program. And they have a pretty robust one, but there probably is a gap still for, for, for patients, and that's really scary and sad. Um, but, but, you know, the next question is, how do we keep you live long enough to, to, to enjoy it? Right, and so if you get to a point where you don't have mobility because you can't walk, or you have, you know, which which will happen now, the, the odds are getting close to one in two, dementia or Alzheimer's, right, at the end of life. So what's the point of staying alive if, if you have one of those two diseases? And yeah. so we need to solve those things. And you know, I joked. I think it was Biden. It's one you can put on a VR headset. <laughs> you can put on a VR headset. But it's you know, I, I think people want reality. People want to want the the real yes. thing. Yeah. But look, you know, Biden, when, when he was vice president for Obama, right as he was coming out of office, he did that moonshot for cancer. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Yes. And directed the federal government to, to spend several billion dollars to try to, you know, the, the private industry was doing that and academia was doing that anyway. He should have done a, 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 a moonshot for, for diseases of the brain, Alzheimer's, dementia, um, because we know nothing. We're not close to solving it. Um, and it is becoming an epidemic. Did you track that story where that academic that put all that research into prions was like falsified? Do you follow that story? Yes, there, there are quite a few of that. Those. So, yeah. That's brutal, right? Because that is was like brutal. billions and billions of dollars R&D is just wasted. Wasted. And, and unfortunately, there, there are quite a few of those um, that exist. And, and look, you know, I, at the end of the day, we all want to live longer. We want to live as a healthy long life, right? And, and so there's really cool technology coming. I'm, I'm optimistic um, that, that we'll see options over the next several years. And you guys are younger than me, so you'll be a bigger beneficiary <laughs> than I am. But right now, we know a big part of the solution. We said it already. Sleep eight hours a day yeah. or as close as you can get. Eat healthy and, and move, exercise. I mean, do you have like a wacky prediction? I feel like the biohacking guys are like, oh, I'm going to live to 180. Brian Johnson's like, oh, I'm going to live forever. Like, do you, are you that optimistic where it's going to impact our generation? Like, yeah, uh, I mean, people? I do think it's going to impact, but, but are you going to go, I, I think average lifespan for a, a, a male in the United States, like 82 or yeah. 79, somewhere in that zone. Yeah. You know, will we be able to bend the curve for your generation to the nineties? Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Will we get you to 190? No chance. <laughs> No okay, chance. so, so you, think, but you think average male lifespan could be in the 90s? So this is a 10%. I, and I think if you took a cohort of people who yeah. followed the golden, you know, if yeah, you and, had and do the right thing, the golden triangle of sleep, eat, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, exercise, and exercise you, yeah. you're probably in the 90s already. Yeah. Okay, so, right. so just the, for avoidance of doubt, so like you, your prediction, I, not to put it into spot, but I'm just kind of curious that you think that in the next five years of technological improvement, we can bend the curve of lifespan 10, 20%, but yes. it's not a 200% type of a thing. I do, and I think, I th and, and, you know, what's important is healthy lifespan, right? If you're end-stage Alzheimer's, why do you, you won't know. It won't matter. But, but look, I, I do think we can get there. And I think if, if people practice today and really focused on the, on the most important factors, right, sleep, eat, exercise, as these, these treatments come, they'll be best positioned to avail themselves of it. And maybe we bend the curve 20%, yeah. right, because people were doing those three things. But walk around the airport. And you're not going to see people who look like they're sleeping, eating, and exercising. So I'm curious to get on on the productivity, pro, like your personal productivity perspective, because I know that Joey wears multiple hats. He started and, and runs better, but also is a venture capitalist. I have multiple hats on anti fund, a couple operating companies. When you when people ask you, how do you context switch so much? Like I don't know what your answer is. I'm curious. Like, are you just smart? Or are you just have a lot no, of energy? I, I, like, what, what's your answer to, like, wow, Brian, I think you're very is a productive. Piece of it. Yeah, energy is a piece of it, but I, I think what works for me may not work for everybody else, but for me, it's, I'm just passionate and fascinated. Like, I'm, I'm intellectually curious all the time. I'm not good when I'm in off mode, right? I'm not good sitting on a beach drinking a margarita. Do I enjoy to do that every once in a while? For sure. But, you know, what makes, you got to find what makes you happy, right? And what, I, and I did, I took a year off from full-time you know, running companies, and I was unhappy. My wife helped me through it a lot. She's like, "You're not happy. What are you doing?" I'm like, yeah, "No, I'm not." How long did it take you to right. get to get bored? Like, because probably the first oh. month or two is no. I, I honestly, God, right I get bored, and, and it's a problem. And I, I recognize the problem. <laughs> but I, like, I plan a, a a week vacation with my wife or family, 
and I look, I'm looking forward to it for months, and I'm thinking about it and thinking about it, and I get there. And like three days and in. And like three days like, in, I'm like this. driving myself nuts. Like, yeah. I, when can I get back to, 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 to deal with You're problems? in some beautiful part of the world, Italy yeah. or something. You're like, oh. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I try to be more, I've gotten better. My wife's really helped me with this, of being present in the moment. Yeah. But, uh, man, it's it's. I love working. I just, it sounds so weird. Much I just love it. great things yeah. to build and great people to build it with. I mean, Brent's answer is basically my answer too, yeah. right? It's like, if I'm like, I'll think about better all day, every day. And, but in like a moment of downtime, if there's an opportunity to like, think about a, you know, potential investment that I can make or a portfolio company that we're helping out or another friend's business that I happen to be involved in, like that would be my, that's what I would consider to be fun. Do right? you want the proof point for all of us? Friday afternoon in Miami. Yeah. It's a beautiful. <laughs> it's a beautiful day. It's yeah. what four four thirty on Friday yeah. on, yeah, on yeah. Miami. It's a beautiful day outside. The Masters are on TV. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. There's so many other things we could be doing yeah. that would yeah. be fun, and I actually would look forward to. It. I'd love to sit outside, smoke a cigar, and watch the Masters. Right. Yeah. And you guys asked me to come do this. I'm like, sure. Like yeah. just meet some interesting people, yeah. hang out, talk about fun stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. That's more fun than doing that. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great point, man. I mean, speaking of Miami and we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but like, so I'm, I'm kind of like you where, so I was born and raised in South Florida actually. And growing up as a kid here, I never thought I could be like a business leader, technology entrepreneur in Miami, moved to New York, went to college, dropped out of school, stayed there for a while, got a place here on the side in 2017, full time here during the pandemic you said you moved here in 2018, which which does make you a pioneer. It's before sort of like a lot of these. I'm a I'm a you were in that, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but like relatively speaking, you're, you're, you're part somewhat of the great a, migration. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, and the early part of that. But how do you think about the future of Miami as like a potential like does this city have an actual opportunity to be like a real technology hub and ecosystem along the likes of a Silicon Valley or New York is Miami going to morph into more of like a Dubai Singapore type where it accommodates a variety of industries. Is it all the above? And what does the city have to do to, to get sort of the, the level of talent and, you know, credibility of like a Silicon Valley to be successful? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Look, I think it has all the potential. I think the things we have to look at and look, walking in here today and seeing your team working on a Friday afternoon, encourages me that that we do have a shot right like every time i see one of these and i see them now more often than not right um but i walked in and i saw that whole team working there i was like wow this is cool this is my this is the new miami right but that being said i, th I think the the watch outs are, are probably two significant maybe three significant things that miami has to improve on to ever get to the potential of like a silicon valley um we need more affordable housing you know how expensive it is to live here yeah. Yeah. so if you're you're a young you know professional coming here and you need to get an apartment and take your first job, it's not easy, right? It's New York City level. And, and it's, it's changed a lot recently, right? Right? Because, you know, back when you were here in 2018. It was very here, affordable. It was super affordable. No, but that's worked in the wrong way, yeah. right? And so so that's one. I think universities, you know, need to step up, right? So, you know, Silicon Valley had Stanford, mm -hmm. right? Um, Austin has UT, right? We need University of Miami to pony up to the bar. And I think they're moving in that direction really excited about where the University of Miami is going, but they've got a little work to do. Um, and then I think the, the third thing we need is, is better education, uh, school systems. So if you're a young family moving here, you have young kids. Um, you saw Ken Griffin today just gave, uh, I saw think like $9 million, $9 million for to the public tiering. school system, yeah. which is yeah. awesome. Because right what now, are, if you have kids, it's like basically Ransom or Pinecrest or Gold. They're all they're, super expensive yeah. and they're hard to get. No, I did now. public school down here, man. It, or it was right. charter school, but it was, you know, free and, and that's all we could afford. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, but we need more of them yeah. and we need them more affordable and kudos to Ken Griffin, 8 million, 9 million. It was 8.8 .8 or $9 million. Yeah, it's, too, it's fantastic. Yeah. To the public school system. Yeah. Like, who does that? So thank yeah. God Chicago lost Ken Griffin and came here, right? Yeah, yeah. Not only the jobs and the buildings he's building and all the stuff he's he's bringing to Miami, like actually making a donation to the public school system. You're, 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 yeah. You believe in Miami. I feel like I'm on the fence a little bit because I feel like every time people want to come visit me in Miami, they're like, let's go out. Where's the boat? I'm just like, dude, I'm just trying to like do like work. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure when people visit that's you. That's okay because. I'm curious how you, how yeah. you navigate that. I, I don't do the, that stuff much. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if someone's got to do it, we go for a normal, like I would in San Fran or New York. I think having 
the option to have fun is is great. I think I think a lot of younger people are really attracted by that. You know, social media has played off the Miami fun scene for quite a bit, and that's great. It's popularized the city. It's as a place to be. But that's our moment, man. We gotta we gotta turn fun into work life balance, and we need the work on this on that side yeah, of it, yeah. right? And people are doing it. Look, look at what you guys are doing here. It's awesome. Yeah, I almost yeah. view it as like a forcing function because there's so many opportunities to like go out and do things that when you're working, like you got to be mega productive yeah. so that you could potentially do some of that and stuff. By the way, I mean, more and more people I end who up don't not do it anymore. The, now, yeah. now, oftentimes I end up not doing it anyway. But like, I for my friends who do have more of that balance, like that, that's kind of how they view it, and they're able to get things done. But, but I got, I agree with Jeff. When yeah. I first came here, everybody asked me, "Where's the boat? What bar are we going yeah. to?" Right? And can we go to and, Eleven? And, it's like, right. uh, yeah. come on, I can't do this right. on Wednesday, yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but but you know, now I honestly have seen a shift in the last year. People coming, they want to have. They want to have business meetings. They want to do all the things I would have done in New York or, or San Fran. Yeah, maybe they want to go to dinner, but they don't want to go to the crazy dinner. They want to go to like just a normal, like a normal dinner, dinner yeah. right? That's fair. I, I agree. I feel like it's also that like the tenor we give off now. It's like, look, I'm not, we're, we're professionals first. Yeah. So look, having that aspect here is great, but you can have a lot of fun in New York City too. Yeah. It does pretty well. You could have a lot of fun in San Fran, but. Maybe not as much, but yeah. not as much. <laughs> maybe yeah. not as much. I take that back. Yeah, I was yeah, thinking yeah. about that after yeah. I said it. Yeah, yeah definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fair point. New New York is. is but I'm I'm there. bullish on on Miami. I think um, we have a couple things to solve as a community, but um, I'm bullish, man. I think I think Miami's. Uh, you know, the mayor Suarez has done a nice job being a spokesperson and ambassador. You know, and uh, you know we we've got a good climate here we've got a lot of good people who've moved here and and so now we need to capitalize on it i mean yeah. this has been awesome appreciate yeah. you coming yeah. here no, i enjoyed it yeah yeah no uh, we uh, we have a pretty big following now so any shout outs to follow you or your, your your business ventures yeah so if people enjoyed this uh conversation feel free to follow me on instagram it's just brent l saunders or on twitter at brent saunders um love to follow you back and and uh you know we can uh, stay in touch Cool. We'll have you awesome. back on soon. Appreciate right. the time. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate you being here, man. Yeah, thanks, man.